Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you're listening to Shut the Front Door, a lighthearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. We are delighted to be joined by Chanel, Lady McCoy, today on Shut the Front Door. In 2018, Chanel was awarded the All-Ireland Business Champion Award for her outstanding achievements in business leadership. She recently founded Chanel McCoy Health, an R&D-led company, launching a wide range of CBD products called Puris. Puris is the first CBD food supplement product available on the market that has been clinically proven to be safe to use, backed by clinical studies. Chanel is a popular business leadership and motivational speaker due to her experience of setting up Chanel McCoy Health, as well as formerly leading Chanel Medical, now Ireland's largest indigenous pharmaceutical company, with over 550 employees and turning over an excess of 110 million. She is also a huge supporter of women in business and mentoring young entrepreneurs. Married to 20 times champion jump jockey, Sir A.P. McCoy, Chanel joined RTE Dragon's Den in 2017. She enjoys sharing her experience of scaling up businesses and taking them to global markets. There is so much to talk about, including the launch of our latest Pierce products. It is with great pleasure to introduce Chanel to Shut the Front Door. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. And, uh, and thanks so much for, for having me, Arlene. Thank you. And how has life been for you um, and how have you been living through the lockdown? Yeah, um, it's uh, actually good. Uh, you know, I mean, we're very lucky here, Arlene. We're based in Berkshire in, in the UK. We're about an hour from London and we have a little bit of land here because we have some horses. Um, you know, so it's great for the kids. They have space and, um, you know, and I, I I nearly feel guilty because, you know, the, the people who are living in smaller spaces in, in apartments with kids, it must be very tough. Um, but we've we've been keeping ourselves busy. Um, AP has hired a digger for himself. So he's been kind of flat out for six weeks on that, doing loads of improvements. <laughs> around uh, around the stables and um you know i've just been been busy with work uh working every day and, and enjoying it actually because it's amazing how much more productive um i'm learning to be without kind of rushing up to london for meetings or on the train or you know flying around to maybe different countries that actually you can get as much done if not even more uh, by by being office based and uh and and getting business done over Zoom calls now. Yeah, that is so true. I totally agree with you. I've I've found we found that we've all been really super productive from home. It's like we have less distractions yeah. in a sense, and you and you know you've got a job to do, and you just focus on that. It's it's kind of nice. I do miss people storming into the office and interrupting me all the time, but then. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's good to get. And I done. think you know. I mean, look, there is you know when I look at my mom, she's isolating in in Lockray in County Galway. You know that it is, it, it's lonely for people. You know, and it's easier probably per, for myself or are you? You know, you may have a busy house and you know the kids and um and that you know, but for people that's on their own, um, it, it, it is tough. And you know, look, we. I miss the girls, you know, I miss going for dinner and having a few drinks in the pub, that, that's for sure. But um, but we're, we're very lucky where we are in lockdown. You know, it's probably made a lot of us maybe reassess our values or, or the way we live our lives, you know. And I think that the one thing that, you know, I appreciate is is being able to spend more time with the, with the children. And, and we have we sit down and we have a lot more meals together because prior to this, you know, AP, would be flying in one direction, I'd be flying in another direction. And, you know, we'd dip in and try and see the kids as, mu- as much as we can. So I think people having, having to slow down, you know, mandatory slow down um, and spend time with, with, with their families. It's probably been very challenging for some families, but, you know, we've certainly found it really beneficial and, and actually learned more about the kids, you know, and see more of their personalities than than, than we probably would have done um, if we hadn't had that opportunity. Yeah, that's lovely, though. That's been a, mm-hmm. that's been a really positive outcome, you know, from all of this. Yeah, yeah, and I think having, having those memories. Yeah, and I think it will change the way people live their lives post COVID. You know, I think we'll all be more mindful of, you know, what you know, spending time with the family and and not kind of running here there and everywhere true and how has homeschooling been for you mm. did you find that it worked out well for you you know the, the crossover from mom to teacher 
Yeah, I mean, it definitely, um, I've never, you gone through so much printer ink, I don't think in my life. <laughs> um, but actually, we're, we're very lucky because um, AP's niece lives with us, um, Shanine McCoy. So she's 21 and she is training to be an account technician. Um, so at the moment, obviously, things are very quiet for her. So she has been fantastic to help with the homeschooling because you know, because b- b- business is, is really busy for me at the moment. You know, I still have to be in the office five days a week and, and put in a lot of hours to get through the work. So um, so that has been, I, I actually don't know how I would have coped um, if, if it wasn't for her. So, yeah, I can take a lot of credit for, for the homeschooling, just, just printing out the work <laughs> on the for the week ahead. Gosh. Well, Chanel, I'd love to chat to you, if I may, about your first childhood memories of growing up and what home was like for you. Yeah, um, I grew up in Lockray, County Galway, and uh, I was number three of five children. And as my mom often reminds me, I was the only one of the five children she never took to a baby beauty show because I was by far the ugliest. Um, but um, I'm over that now. <laughs> so I I doubt be- that. No, it is, it's actually true. So it is. Um, I mean, I was really a horrid looking baby. But, um, you know, and, and look, I, you know, we had a lovely childhood growing up in Loch Ray and, you know, my parents set up their pharmaceutical business, um, you know, over f- kind of 40 years ago. Um, so, you know, I suppose from a, from a young age, all of us worked up in up in the factory uh, in the company to earn our pocket money from when we were very young. I'd say, you know, five, six, seven years old, um, you know, and my dad was a vet and, you know, we had great memories of going out on calls with him. Um, we have a beautiful lake in Loch Ray. We're so lucky. And, you know, we spent many, um, many days and hours up there, um, you know, so so really nice memories um, of, of, of Loch Ray growing up there. Lovely. And what was your own teenage bedroom like? Um, do you know, I had a bunk bed. I actually, I'm just thinking now, I, I remember even when I was going out with, um, when I started dating my husband, like I was 21, I still had my bunk bed actually. But obviously being from a good Catholic house, there was uh, no boys were allowed to stay over until we were married. We, it doesn't even matter if we were engaged, um, you know, but of course, uh, back then I was when I was younger I was really into like Wham and George Michael and they were like the posters uh, on on my wall and ponies loved you know all the the, the pony riding as well and kind of the bit of hunting with the Gola Blazers um, so yeah that was it. but you know it was a small nice a small little room <laughs> so it was nice right. so Wham mm. Wham was on the walls that's hilarious <laughs> yeah. when did you uh d- then decide to leave the nest where did you go first so we all five of us went to boarding school so um i went to loretto abbey in rathfarnham in dublin which subsequently now has closed down and is a lovely apartment block um so we used to get home maybe once every six weeks so we used to get the train to banislow so i Every time I pass Banaslow, sometimes I still get that kind of lump in my stomach that I, I get when you're hopping on the train to go back to school, knowing that you won't be home again for six weeks. But, um, you know, that was a good experience and it was great for, you know, your confidence and your independence. And it, for me, it was it was a great start in life. Um, you know, and then I went on um, after school to study marketing and finance in, in DIT. Um, and then went on to, to to get a master's from from Tr- Trinity and MA. So um, I was always really keen to join the family business, which was the pharmaceutical business that my parents had had set up, which was a veterinary company. Um, and you know, but my parents were very strong in terms of go and get experience elsewhere, and you know, bring something back to the company. So I went off to the UK and um, became a rep for a pharmaceutical company called Wyatt. Um, and it was actually, it was a very good character building because, you know, I was going into the doctor's surgeries to to sell product to them. But, you know, sometimes it was very hard to get past the receptionist, um, you know, and you'd often get a, get a no. And, um, you know, but but I learned kind of how to negotiate and how to charm people and try to get around them. So th- there was lots of packets of biscuits you know, offered to the receptionist to try and bribe my way in, um, mm-hmm. you know, because I think it's good like that, you know, not not getting things too too easy and and learning like that how to how to horse trade and and haggle with with people. Um, yeah, so I spent 
spent two years there and then came back and joined the business. And that's when, you know, the medical business was just starting to get going. So um, I I was responsible for, for scaling the medical business. Um, Michael, uh, my father was looking after the veterinary business, um, you know, and ended up bringing the medical business into 96 markets over 18 years um, and probably getting two and a half thousand medical licenses granted around the world. Um, so, you know, super, super experience um, doing that and lots of knockbacks and learned how to be resilient and how to negotiate and, you know, how, you know, making mistakes and taking the learning out, out of mistakes. Um, you know, so so that 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 was great. I mean, I, I have since left the family business in Lockray, but I still have my my shares and all of that in there, um, you know, and, and, and gone on to, to set up my, my own company now. Fantastic. And I believe you've just launched a new groundbreaking product called Puris. I believe it's the first CBD food supplement clinically approved in the UK. Is that correct? Yeah. So I was always very passionate about CBD, probably for the last four or five years and um, the the healing properties of, of CBD. And, you know, CBD is part of the cannabis plant, but it is the good part of the cannabis plant in terms of it has got no psychoactive effect. It's not addictive and it doesn't give you a high. It purely has the healing properties. The other part of the um, this cannabis plant, which does have some healing properties, is THC. And that is the part of the plant that is addictive and does give you a high at, at high quantities. So, you know, so mine is just pure CBD, um, which is not addictive and, and doesn't give you high. So at the moment, there's 30 CBD food supplement products on the market in, in the UK and Ireland. Um, so we have invested um, a lot of money in clinical studies because all of these products on the market at the moment in the UK, um, as I'm speaking today, um, have no clinical studies behind them to prove they are safe and not toxic to to the body. So we have done um, a suite of clinical studies over the last two years, um, proving that um, that our CBD raw material is fully safe and not toxic. You know, we looked at literally 26 parts of the body in terms of every organ, every gland, cells, bloods, everything. So at least, you know, with our product coming on the market, which will be the first CBD food supplement clinically proven to be safe. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're quite proud of that because it's taken four years to get there and our raw material is FDA registered. Um, the FDA are, are basically the strictest pharmaceutical sheriffs in the world. They're, they're the US pharmaceutical sheriffs. So they have looked at our raw material and given us um, FDA approval because of the high quality of the raw materials. So, you know, so we're, we're ex- very excited about it because CBD sometimes does get some bad press or there is a a confusion between is it addictive and you know maybe it's not very safe but we just what we wanted to come out with a really good product really high quality very safe to hopefully stand out from the crowd and to give people trust and confidence to start taking a cbd oil you know that that is safe to take my goodness and do you think there's an opportunity for cbd in light of covid19 yeah, and and actually, probably what I should have um, what what I should have said earlier on is is if you look at the global CBD, CBD market now, this is not cannabis; it's just CBD. In two thousand and eighteen, it was one billion the market size globally. It is predicted to grow from one billion to sixteen billion in eight years, right? So it's huge growth globally, you know, and that's why you'll see it, and you'll see it in so many not just food supplements, you know, you'll see it in water and tea and coffee and, um, you know, lots of other areas. But when you look at the UK market alone, so the CBD market in the UK is currently 300 million. And if you compare that to vitamin C market in the UK, that's 115 million. And vitamin D market in the UK is 110 million. So actually, CBD at the moment in the UK is bigger than vitamin C and vitamin D together. That's phenomenal. so, and the growth, I mean, the UK market will go, will grow from 300 million today to 1 billion in, in the next four years, you know, so there, and, you know, look, it does have incredible 
healing properties. You know, we have a number of people on our product over the last number of months. We did a soft, you know, we actually did a soft launch of our product back in January and February in the UK. And the results are very, um, they're so um, mixed. You've made very happy, you know, people who have, you know, let restless leg syndrome, you know, that it is totally eased off. People who have very bad neck pain who have knee pain uh people's nails are being becoming so much stronger uh, particularly we have a few um few young people on it um who who you know for anxiety um i personally take obviously i i take it every day and the one thing i notice is is i have so much more patience with the kids and i'm not flying off the handle and you know they say to me mommy you're so less shouty and it's just I just feel I can cope better with things. Um, I feel a bit more balanced kind of internally. And, and you know, mm. I definitely, I, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, makes me think more rationally and I definitely have more patience. I mean, even, even AP notices, I mean, he's on it because he, he, he had a huge amount of bones broken during his career and he would be stiff in the morning. Um, but he, uh, he's, he's been taking it now since, since early January and he just doesn't have the stiffness that he had, um, you know, so look, I can only speak from experience with people who are taking, you know, my product and that come back repeatedly every month, you know, looking for more because they're getting, you know, such, such good results from it. Um, you know, so, and yes, people thank God, it, does it really heal everything? You know, that nearly sounds too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Um, and I won't go into how it works because I'll only probably put your listeners to sleep, but it is no, not at all interesting you know in our bodies we have a system in our bodies called the endocannabinoid system it's like we have a central nervous system we have an immune system you know so this endocannabinoid system is just another system in our bodies and this is what when you take cbd it binds to the receptors in your endocannabinoid system and the endocannabinoid system runs literally from head to toe um you know so it's nearly like a multivitamin for your nervous system, I suppose, is, is another way of looking at a CBD. But, you know, so, but, but on the back of COVID, I mean, that's an interesting question um, because actually I looked recently and there is 693 clinical studies ongoing at the moment for, for CBD. Um, and of those studies, actually 172 of those studies are in the area of Parkinson's. You know, which which it you know, which is very exciting because it it you know shows that there are a number of big pharma companies you know seriously looking at CBD um, for the future and to you know doing trials on on patients with Parkinson's you know to to bring out a drug uh, with an indication you know for the likes of Parkinson's pain would be the next thing. I mean, it would be amazing to try and find a, a good product like CBD that people can come off opioids, you know, those people that are on tramadol and morphine, you know, just to be able to cope with their daily life. But they, those drugs have psychoactive effects. You know, it's very difficult for people to drive, to to, to, to function. Um, you know, there's very bad constipation with some of these drugs. And a drug like CBD, you know, at, at the right dose is can be very effective in pain, hence why there's 58 clinical studies, you know, globally going on with, with, with it. And this, you know, because it has no psychoactive or addictive effects, you know, people can manage their pain, hopefully can go back to work, you know. Um, so look, and, and then, you know, you look at epilepsy, you know, and the kids, I mean, that the kids with multiple seizures and severe epilepsy, that, mm. you know, for them, they just need pure CBD, you know, absolutely no, no THC in it. And there's incredible results with kids you know and even you, you know I, I listen to a lot of TED talks you know and there's some really really good talks on that about you know consultants and professors that are treating these children with pure CBD and they have gone from literally considering to give these children horse tranquilizers because they couldn't stop the seizures to then discovering CBD putting these kids on CBD and the seizures you know dramatically reduce if not go away That's you know classic Manage, yeah. So, I mean, there is some really serious literature out there um, to, to support it. But, you know, I think with, with the COVID thing, you know, I mean, um, sadly, you know, when people are hospitalized and, and they nearly die, it's it's due to the inflammation, you know, that their heart and their lungs and their respiratory um, become so over inflamed. So for people who, 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 
get discharged from hospital and, and survive. You know, they are normally discharged on six weeks of steroids to bring down the inflammation. Um, you know, so look, it would be very exciting to 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 do a trial or to look at a trial for potential um, CBD um, to treat patients for inflammatory because because it works so well. Um, you know, for for joint mobility, for for pain, for you know, th- there are some some papers already, clinical papers written, you know, about CB about CBD and and in, inflammatory and and why CBD is is a good anti-inflammatory. So, you know, look, maybe maybe that's an angle. Who who knows? <laughs> yes, it's so interesting. Even as you're speaking, Chanel, I'm just thinking of at least six people that I feel that that would be well suited to yeah, well okay so the thing is with ours right is that you know we can claim we are ultra pure cbd because there is nothing else in it there's no traces of any other cannabinoids in it there's no traces of thc there's no you know because when i explain to people sometimes about by cannabis you know the cannabis plant is like a magnet it sucks everything out of the soil and that's why in Chernobyl they planted thousands of acres of cannabis plant was to clean clean up the soil there. Oh, so you know, yeah. So when you have a plant product, you know, like a plant cannabis, you know, it it, it sucks. You know, so you you get heavy metals, you get terpenes, you get other cannabinoids, you get pesticides, pollutants. You know, it's subjected to a lot of other um, elements within the plant. So actually. You know, we went down kind of more the pharmaceutical route, even though we are a food supplement and and we have gone with actually a synthetically produced uh, CBD raw material. Um, And I think that's, you know, that was another reason as well why the FDA gave us the approval was because when they looked at our raw material, you know, which our raw material is the exact, you know, the, the DNA of our raw material is the exact same of the DNA of the plant, you know. But when they looked at it, they could see that there was nothing else in it. It was pure CBD, um, you know, and I think that is why we are different. And when you look at the trend, a lot of pharmaceutical companies are taking, you know, and, and some of these trials in Parkinson's and pain, a, a number of these companies are using synthetic CBD uh, raw material because they are, don't risk any other components within the raw material um, interfering with the study, you know, so they're guaranteed there's no THC, there's no terpenes, there's no heavy metals, there's no pollutants, no pesticides. And and actually, when, when you look at the plant CBD, in order to try and get pure CBD out of the plant, unfortunately, they the plant has to go through a lot of chemical processes to to isolate the plant because they have to, to isolate, sorry, the CBD because they've got to get rid of everything else out of the plant in order to just be left with the CBD from the plant. So, you know, so there, there is, there is quite a lot of chemical manipulation with, with, with the plant actually. Um, so yeah, so that's, you know, that's where we've gone and, and that's why we, we know our product is very safe because it's clinically proven to absolutely be clean and be safe and just contain CBD with no THC. My goodness. And how will we be able to get our hands on this wonder product? Um, so, yeah, um, you can go on to Purus um, CBD, P-U-R-E-I-S, CBD.com, um, and you, you can purchase there. And um, also we're launching into um, a number of pharmacies and retailers um, throughout the summer um, as well. So, yeah, we're we're. We're well on the way now with our with our uh, ramped up launch after our staff launch earlier in the year. My gosh, Chanel, your career has been just so impressive. Really, you're you're some woman for one woman. Uh, well, I, and actually, I have to say, right, I so the company we I set up when I left Chanel McCoy, um, when I, when I, when I left um, Chanel Pharma in Loch Ray, um, our company is is called Chanel McCoy Health, and I have a fantastic business partner. So I'm not doing all this on my own. Um, Caroline Glynn, who I worked with for many years in Chanel Pharma in Ireland, and she helped me scale the medical business um, up into into the 96 markets. So um, she is a very clever lady and deserves a lot of the credit because she's got her degree in pharmacology and her master's in biomedical science and her master's in law. So, you know, she, I, we would not, I would not be where I am today without her help. I mean, we have done this together um, to, to, to get this product to, to market. So she, she looks after all this, the science part and the, the regulatory and the clinical studies. Um, yeah, no, but Ka- Caroline Glynn is, it's amazing. And it's lovely to have 
a lot a business partner that that you get on really well with because sometimes when you're in business on your own it can be kind of lonely as well you know mm -hmm. that's very true and it's just uh it seems also exciting for you do you do you get um very charged about the whole process of this does it excite you to see wonderful yeah. that this coming um, to market? It, it, it does. And, you know, look, I, the, the reason, uh, you know, we, we, we started on this quest was because being mothers, Caroline, now, you know, when you listen to these families who, um, you know, their kids suffer from epilepsy or multiple, you know, the Dravet syndrome, the seizures, and they want to access the CBD because they know it can absolutely um, help manage the condition with their children. And then these families are not able to get access to it and they have to remortgage their homes and try and travel to you know, to Holland or somewhere to, you know, to access it. And I just listened to this and knowing that we have this fantastic raw material with, with our FDA approval, I just thought this is absolutely criminal that these people do not have access, you know, to 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 a drug for the, for these kids. So so that was really kind of what motivated us to uh, on this journey is that we we just wanted to bring out a really safe, high quality raw material uh, product you know, and that was, you know, starting in the food supplement arena to make it available to everybody, you know, at at, at, at the low, you know, we, we offer 10 milligram a day and 20 milligrams a day, you know, and then ultimately, you know, we'll do further studies um, to to be able to get it into the prescription arena, um, you know, but but that was really what motivated, motivated us to start um, for, for people to be in. There is a drug available out there, you know, and why can't these children get access to it? Yeah. There's, I mean, they have enough of challenges on their hands not to at least try. I mean, this sounds yeah. really, really I, impressive. I think every, you know, every business has to have a why, you know, and that was our why, that was our purpose, you know, was to, you know, bring, you know, like that relieve anxiety or maybe relieve pain or, you know, maybe, you know, so. so That was the have, motivator. That's the motivator. For me, it's values before dollars. It's not about the money here. This is about you know, really trying to help people have a better quality of life, you know, a better, better health, you know, and great if, you know, if, if the money comes in, you know, well, we're obviously not going to be silly about it. You know, we need to cover our costs and we need to make make a few quid definitely. But, you know, I do feel that, you know, when you've got the right values in the company and, you know, you're building up a lot of brand loyalty and people know that you're probably more focused on values before dollars, the money will will come anyway. Yeah, and you believe in it, and it's coming across, you know, and you're passionate about it. Yeah. So we're happy to stand by this. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and especially from the feedback I've had from people, you know, who who are taking it at the moment. It just makes me very. That's what makes me very excited and just happy that I'm helping people. Well, you've it's certainly happy. piqued my interest. That's for sure. <laughs> I'll definitely send you some. Um, definitely, for sure, for, for sure. Your mom. 100% my mum, yeah, for sure. How interesting. Yeah. And you've also been involved in the Dragon's Den. Um, yeah. What made yeah. you take on that role and, and did you enjoy it? And what was um, it about? Yeah, um, you know, look, to be honest, I, I, I love anything kind of to do with business and it just, it interests me. And, you know, I think probably since we were kids and sitting at the, at the dinner table as kids and listening to, it was always business conversation um, at, at the dinner table. And, you know, and, and when I was asked to do it, um, I kind of thought, well, you know, I have experience with scaling a business, with co-running a business, you know, with lots of different elements of business that I just felt that, you know, I, I, I felt in my comfort zone to go on there and, and to do it. Um, and I thought it's nice to be able to give somebody an opportunity to get their business going if I can financially help them because you know yes it is your own money that that you have to bring to the table um and you know you're you're making these investments you get no prior warning of the pitch that's going to come in um, you know so you you really are you know on the spot to to make a decision which is good because that's part of the excitement um definitely and and you know I had one rule going into the den that I was never going to invest in a business I knew nothing about because for me, you know, you can't relate to it. You can't add value. You can't challenge. Um, so, you know, so so that that and actually, I remember one particular pitch. You know, this this young guy came into the den, and um, he, um, you know, looked 
looked pretty terrified and and he had developed an algorithm for the gaming industry and you know it really sounded like this was going to be the next big thing and you know he'd been working on this algorithm for the last kind of four or five years literally from his bedroom at night um to to taking it to where where he got it to um on the den and you know, you can really sense the desperation um, in, in you know, in his face. And, uh, I, you know, I said to him, if you don't get investment here today in the den, you know, h- how much money have you left to keep going? And, you know, he had enough money for maybe like two months, you know, and uh, he said, well, if I don't get investment here today, you know, that's it. I've closed, you know, the company closes in, 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 in two months time and he two people work on firm. Um, you know, when you hear that and you, you have that sense of, des- you know, the sense of desperation, you just emotionally you just want to throw them a few quid just to keep the dream alive but then you know from a business point of view you know and that's why sometimes in business you have to strip the emotion out of decisions you know when you have to you know so I mean sadly he didn't get investment that day in the den but you know that was a kind of for me an example of you know you don't know anything about the gaming industry Chanel you can't relate to it you know so you know so that that was that was my kind of um, selection criteria yeah so do you find that you often kind of it's a mixture for you of finding your your head, your heart and your gut all together? Yeah, I mean, if I can relate to it, you know, I mean, I, I invested in uh, an origami children's um, children's craft kind of book. Um, and that was fine because I could relate to that. I had children, you know, and I knew, you know, how kids love, you know, origami or origami and also the whole craft thing, you know. So I have to be able to relate to it or know something about it um but uh i wouldn't go a lot on the heart to 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 be honest with you um and you know yeah there's always the gut feeling but you know i'd have to have figures in front of me um you know that that yeah that's that's the key that's the key thing you know for me is um is knowing you know where the financially the company is in at the moment and what debt it's in and you know that that kind of stuff so it's it's a mixture but um, it was a great experience, you know. I, I learned a lot in there as well, um, and it's just, you know, it's 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 lovely to be able to give people a start and to to mentor people as well. Um, if well, as long as I'm adding value. <laughs> yes, for sure. And the dots connect, then then you're yeah. happy with it all. Yeah. And who have you been most impressed by that you've met within the industry on your travels? Who have I most been impressed by? Um, you know, I mean, like I'm very lucky. I have a few mentors, um, in, in the industry. I mean, one particular gentleman, um, his name is Dr. Yusuf Hamid. He, he's the, his father was the founder of a company called Sipla. It's the largest indigenous pharmaceutical company in India. They would have 10,000 reps. I mean, they're a billion dollar company. Um, you know, he's, he's an older gentleman now, you know, he's, he's in his eighties, but he he was the man that um, made the AIDS drugs available in Africa at a, at a very cheap price while the AIDS drugs were still under under patent. You know he was able to provide the product about you know ninety percent cheaper, um, and uh, you know so so did a huge amount for saving people's lives with you know that ha- had AIDS, um, and so I'm very close to him. I speak to him probably now at the moment every week because we talk about COVID and the different clinical trials that are going on. He's very involved in the COVID vaccines, uh, what's happening. He's often on CNN, um, you know, but so I've been very lucky to have that access to to Dr. Hamid for the last probably 20 years and to be able to pick up the phone and ask for an opinion and just listen to him. When you spend time with people like that, you know, it's very, for me, I'm like a sponge. And even their values and and the the culture that they that you know that they instill in their companies, the way they treat people, um, h- how their companies are people focused. I've learned a huge amount from him. Um, another man, Dr. Dallas Burston. Again, he's in his seventies now. He's been a really good mentor to me, probably especially in the last probably five years. He's actually launching the first needle free. Uh, device to monitor your glucose levels in your blood for diabetes um, and he's uh, he's kindly given me the rights of that product for Ireland so we I will be launching at the end of this year in Ireland the first needle free way of of monitoring your glucose levels um, so you won't have to prick your finger 
you know, you, you wear a device on your arm and, um, and it, anyway, it's quite, quite sophisticated technology, um, but very simple to wear very, there is no needle at all. Um, you know, so, and I've, I've been lucky in the pharma industry to be exposed to people like that, who are super clever, who are very visionary, you know, they, they really can see what, what things should look like ahead and they're executors, you know, because sometimes you get great leaders they're very visionary, but they, they, they're not executors. Um, so th- those two gentlemen, um, are, are uh, and I know I should be talking about a lady, um, a lady leader, but we're probably a little bit thin on the ground. Um, you know, I mean, Michelle Obama, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Michelle Obama's and I follow yeah. her very, very closely. I just think everything about her, you know, her humanity, her, her business, you know, skills, her, She's so astute. Um, you know, she, she, uh, as a mother, as a wife, you know, she she sacrificed a lot, you know, in her own career, um, to to follow her, you know, to be there for her husband. So, yeah, no, there's few few people like that. Yeah, I'm a big fan as well. Yeah. Um, and are you a woman of many lists, Chanel? I'd imagine you are. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I am absolute to do list fanatic. <laughs> Um, and actually, I even see my daughter Eve now, who's twelve. Um, you know, I see her getting up in the morning now, and she is at her desk, and uh, you know, she's writing down kind of what are her key things to achieve. Um, you know, every morning, um, I, I well, every every evening before I log off uh, off the emails, I I write out what needs to be done tomorrow, um, and you know, I put timelines against everything because there's always kind of two or three key. Um, things you know work either proposals or important emails or contracts that need to be responded to because I think if I get those three key things done tomorrow then I have achieved um, you know something because you know we can all be busy fools and four or five hours can go and you still haven't cleared off much emails or ticked off any things in the to-do list so it just helps me focus um, so I would uh, be be quite organized like that because I like to see progress um, and I like to see what my goals are and take yeah. them off. Yeah. And kind of nearly you're almost gifting yourself by doing those three extra things every day. It just makes the next day easier for you. Yeah, it, definitely. And it's that sense of achievement. Um, you know, it's great when you, you know, you log off in the evening and you feel satisfied and, you know, and actually even, you know, speaking to other women over the years and especially, I suppose, being married to, uh, a successful sportsman um you know i i get a lot of my self confidence and my self esteem from work um because it's that sense of achievement um you know at the end of the day and i think you know i think anybody who's married to a successful sportswoman sportsman or business person you know those people are have to be very selfish you know to achieve um really you know the top top of their game and i mean ap was champion jockey for 20 years so you know he was incredibly focused on on him and his career and his weight and um you know his his championships every year and you know there was often times that he'd come home and he wouldn't be bothered about how my day was or what was happening in my life um and I kind of got that you know be, you know and they wouldn't obviously be um you know giving you a bit of attention wouldn't be far up their list of priorities but you know I kind of thought you know what look I you know, I'm getting my attention, my self-confidence in work, because at that time, you know, when I go into work, I had like a plethora of people that would say to me, Chanel, what do I do about this? Can you help me? You know, how, how guide me on this? You know, so I always felt that sense, of, you know, being needed and being worth, worthy. Um, yeah. So I often say to the women sometimes, you know, look, if you can keep something going yourself that gives you that self-confidence and self-esteem, it's it's very important to have that you know because sometimes you're not going to get it from your partner yeah for sure and having your own passion is really important Mm -hmm. your own focus is really important too yeah definitely yeah and it it, you know we we all need a purpose you know we need a purpose to get out of bed we need a purpose and even if there is just one goal that you and you know one thing on your to-do list that you decide you know that you're going to do I mean it could be as simple as I'm going to post that letter today you know it's done. It doesn't matter how big or small it is. It is something that you have set your goal in the morning and and you've achieved it. Mm-hmm. And have you always been goals driven or is that something you learned about yourself as you as you've come along through your career? Um, I, I have always been being goals driven. I, I think 
you know, looking back over the years, um, it was always I all was always very busy. You know, when when a company is growing, you know, there's there's loads going on and, and there's a lot firing at you know you're, there's a lot coming at you so for me it was all about I have to prioritize I can't do everything you know there's, there's like 200 emails I'm, I'm not going to get through those today right prioritize so I always had that um that the importance of prioritization um so that then kind of drove me to like pick out the important things to do get those done and then you know the less important stuff you can do you know back then I used to work every weekend I think I'll do them at the weekend but um yeah, so so that the 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 be having to be prioritized to get the the important stuff done kind of drove me then to do my to do lists and setting my goals, you know, every day or every week. And do you ever feel nervous about tackling something? Are you a real feel the fear and do it anyway type of person? I I mean, the one thing about me is there is a solution to everything, you know, and I think. You know, what's very important is, you know, especially now when, when you look at what's happening with, with COVID as well, is, you know, is the ability to, you know, to stay calm. Um, because as a leader, you know, when you start to to display, you know, anxiety or worry or fear or panic or emotional, you know, or that instantly is it is the feeling that your team starts to to feel, you know, and I think that's why, you know, especially at the moment, you know, with with COVID, you know, I mean, I would be thinking the most important thing for leaders at the moment is the first thing is, you know, to conserve cash and to be able to do less with more. You know, you need to take off. You need to look after your people. You need to look after yourself. You need, you know, the mental strength, you know, and you need to get match fit. For, for what's coming down the road, the road next, you know, so, um, you know, so, so, I mean, there are, there are some, especially from a scientific and a regulatory environment that we're in, there are some really challenging hurdles, but, but it's great because it makes you solution driven. And actually another thing that I've observed as well, you know, just reading up about leaders in COVID, in the time of COVID, there's so many leaders out there that are so used to maintaining the status quo of a company, right? That, you know, that's all they need to do is just keep the ship steady. And now they're coming out of keeping the, of maintaining the status quo. They've now been, now they're in this mindset of, of, of finding solutions every day to, to problems, you know, and, and that is to go from that mindset, you know, from maintaining status quo into like, consistently having to find solutions it's very challenging but you know it really there's some really good leaders shining through here you know that 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 are and some leaders that are being exposed that they are not you know that they're probably not good enough to be to be leading in in a time of crisis because they don't yeah. have strategic they're out of their depth yes yeah you know they don't have strategic agility you know you need to potentially even you know jump into another industry to make money and jump back into another or, you know, and to take safe risks, you know, um, at the moment, because, you know, companies, this is all at the moment, it's all about surviving, you know, and then you're going to look at how to revive the business. And after that, then you're going to look at how, how you get the business to thrive, you know, and that's, you know, that, that, that that's the kind of, you know, and it's, I mean, it's, it's hell for, for some people at the moment, especially with cash, as Churchill said, you know, when you're going through hell, you just have to keep going. Yeah, I yeah. loved him. And <laughs> you find human behavior is really important to kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I just think human behavior, like for me, I'm, I I just love talking about culture and values and all that. I, mean, I could I could bore you all day about that, you know, but I think. Trust is the currency that we're trading in now. You know, it's never, it's, it has never been the, you know, the most important currency than now, you know, because especially for leaders, you know, credibility is the foundation of trust. And, you know, it's so important to build trust, um, not just between you and your team, but to build trust amongst the team as well, you know, and, I mean, it's so important, you know, to confront the reality, you know, take the, you know, take the bad news head on, give, give the bad news. But, you know, having loads of transparency, you know, being really open, don't hide anything, you know, um, and talk straight, you know, tell just tell the truth. Um, and 
I think it's very important to extend trust to your people as well, because you need to be able to tell people, I trust you to work at home in your environment. You know, I, I trust you to do that. And, you know, it's that whole and that's why at the moment empathy as a leadership trait is now more important than ever, because we need as leaders to show we care. We care about how you're getting on emotionally at home, working in isolation. Um, and that is a struggle for some leaders as well, you know, is 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 that empathy piece, you know. But that's so very true. Relationships, you know, are very uh, are, are very important now and, and leaders need to focus on relationships. They need to leaders need to talk less and listen more, but they need to really listen um, and have those one on ones with with their team. Yeah. And learning how to maintain those relationships mm-hmm. is important, too. Yeah. And, and to be consistent, you know, com, com, coming out the back of of this with, you know, with, with COVID. COVID. Definitely. And what's your personal opinion on, on, say, for example, how we've managed in Ireland? Do you think, how do you think we're doing politically over here? Oh, dear, that's a tough question. <laughs> to completely. Yeah. I have to say, I mean, look, everyone's got an opinion, you know, and I'm yeah. I'm not reading the Irish papers daily. I, I just I, I just read it on a Sunday because obviously I get the English papers more over here and I can only go out any time to read read one paper. Um, you know, I do think Leo has has handled this very well. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, sure. he has, you know, maintained the safety of the people. You know, the numbers have been very low. I think he responded very very quickly um and you know how the economy will will come out of this i'm not sure i mean ireland was in a very good economic position before this you know it really was thriving the employment was down as low as it's uh, as it's ever been um you know so there certainly will be um will be a hangover uh economically from this but it you know it depends on on how the government support support the businesses and get these young, get these, um, uh, get, get, you know, get, get the startups back up and running, get the, you know, that, that there really has to be some very practical initiatives put in place and support, financial support and, and mentoring support to get these businesses back because, um, you know, the, 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 there are going to be, you know, closures, there are going to be um, job losses to it. But, but I, I wouldn't criticize him on much. I, I think he's done a good yeah. job and I think he has showed him. I think if there was a re-election uh, after this, I think he'd be, he'd be voted back in. Yeah. I mean, really crazy circumstances for him at the moment. You know, it's not been easy for anyone really on the front line. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he's, what I like about him is he's, he's, his communication is a lot clearer. There's a lot of clarity on there. I mean, you know, I, I watch those conferences nearly every day with Boris. I mean, it is just lots of stuttering and stammering and um and maybe and we think and we you might be able to I mean it is just so no clarity, no, you know, no powerful delivery, you know, and I just I, I'm I'm a bit disappointed. I think they have for some in you know, for some in economies and for the furlough scheme, I think they have support it quite well you know there are some industries like the airline industries that really need to be um need, need further assistance yeah goodness a lot of things need a lot of assistance it's going to take um it's going to mm. take a long time before we can get back to where we were even like last december yeah if we if we ever get back there but hopefully if we ever get back there but that's let's, let's stay positive yeah you know, we've got a good fighting spirit over here so hopefully yeah we'll you know what through. I think for a lot of companies as well, it's, you know, it's time to kind of be creative and look at diversifying um, and uh, looking at, you know, other monetization models that can be adopted. And I mean, it's like what they say, you know, when the fisherman can't fish, you know, he sits down and mends his net. You know, I think that's Mm. that's what companies, you know, should take that opportunity to do. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And. Chanel, back to you. What's your own personal style like uh, interiors wise on a lighter uh, subject? Just I would, to... I'd probably say definitely no clutter. I mean, my house is everything has a place. You know, I don't have anything on the countertop. Um, I mean, even the toaster and, and the kettle. So I like minimalistic, um, 
I have a little touch of OCD, which I think is a good thing, you know. Um, so I like I like everything neat and tidy and uh, and put away. Um, you know, so the house would be, um, uh, you know, would would be I suppose probably a little bit elegant. You know, I'm not I'm not very boho. Even as a when I dress myself, I can't really pull off that style, uh, even though it's quite it's quite on trend at the moment. So mm-hmm. uh, you know, it would be kind of I suppose more elegant, simple, um, yes. non clutter type type house even though we have the only thing that does clutter up is probably all of ap's trophies there's like so so many there which is, <laughs> which is nice mm-hmm. yeah definitely and did you build your own home um where you are now we did yeah uh we built it six years ago actually fantastic builders from from belfast came over um or from, from antrim and and built it on time on budget um and we're very lucky we were um we're in the lambourne downs you know, so we have just lovely views of gallops and horses and fields. There's really, uh, we're in actually an area, it's called an area of outstanding natural beauty. So we've lovely views. There's there's no houses around us. The only reason we got planning permission to build a house was because the stables, we had to build stables as well. And because we are in the heart of Lambourne, which is like the epicenter of horse race, and it would be the equivalent of the Curra. Um yeah, so so it's good. So we have, I mean, AP has a pre-training yard here. Um, his uh, we've we a guy, Kieran O'Brien, who's amazing, runs it, and we've about forty horses there now. None of those horses are ours, but they come in to be broken as babies, or they come in in rehabilitation or rest. Um, and it's great, you know, because AP can kind of dip in and out of that business because he's still he's very involved with um JP and Ori McManus with with their racing and, and looking after their horses um in England the horses that run and the horses that are being bought and sold um you know so that's that's a big part of um you know his his uh, his career now uh so it's great he can kind of come in go up to the yard and he can sit on some of the babies that are just being broken and i think he actually gets a bit of a thrill getting having a fall now and again because i think he misses the the danger <laughs> and the injuries you know he he comes in sometimes you know into the house quite pleased with himself that he's just got got milled on the gallop by like a little 2 year old <laughs> that That's he's got hilarious. he's and where's your favorite place in your home? Where would be your spot, like if you wanted to read the Sunday newspaper? Uh, I do like my dressing room because it's up. The, it's two story house, but we have a third that we put on a, a kind of a, a little third story for, for the dressing room. And there's just it's all glass, you know, and you sit there and you can. And actually, it's away from the kids and AP. And, and when the girls come over, you know, that's where we go upstairs uh, either grab grab a pot of tea or grab a bottle of wine or something, and we we sit up there and chat. Not lots of natural daylight. Yes, all natural. Yeah, daylight because the the the, the wall of the room just it's all glass and kind of looks out over the, the Lambourne Downs. So we're we're very lucky. But you know, I mean, as AP said, he you know the house is lovely, but he said he's he's been in the in the back of a lot of ambulances for his house, so he. Did. He doesn't feel guilty about having a nice house. Well, this leads me now to my next question. How did you find having a camera crew in your home filming uh, being AP, which I loved, by the way? Oh, what thank that you. Like? That's uh, that's nice. Um, so we were approached by BBC Films the um, the year before AP uh, retired to ask, you know, could they do um, a documentary on him and they wanted to bring it straight to cinema? You know, at the start... You know, because AP is quite private, you know, he 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 didn't want to do it and, um, you know, was very flattered. But, you know, then he he thought about it and, and Archie, our son, who's six, um, has no memories of AP writing. And he kind of thought, actually, you know, maybe it might be nice to do it so that when Archie's older, he can watch it and and um, and understand what what my life was like as a jockey. Um, so so the process began and we began we had a fabulous director and a producer and the camera crew and the sound guys there was probably 12 of them and they spent a year and a half with us um in the house at the races with our friends um and they were just such a lovely non-intrusive crew um and you know from from we were very lucky you know ap had had editorial rights over the film because there are some very sensitive conversations that Ha- that happens in racing you know between the trainer and the owner and you know and also having exposure to you know a- access to the likes of John Joe O'Neill or JP McManus you know they're very private people so 
we were never going to get access, you know, on, unless they knew that AP could take out anything out of the movie that wasn't uh, correct or, you know, that was too sensitive to, to go in. Um, so from day one, there was just that total relaxed comfort. We were totally ourselves. We had our little Barneys and everything because we just knew, look, this is us. And and if anything is too sensitive, then it, it can come out. And actually, when we went to the first cut of, of the film, uh, we, we didn't we didn't make any changes. I mean, it was just we, we thought it was well kind of articulated. Um, and, you know, look, we were just so proud to um, to be asked to do it, but also um, for, for the kids to have it. And I think it gave a good insight into sometimes how tough a jockey's life can be and, and the dangers that they go through. I mean, it's it the only, incredible. It's probably one of the only jobs where you you go to work and there's an ambulance following behind you every day. So yeah, if, yeah. it's it's good. It's a good movie be, being AP. Yeah. It's, it's, it's well done. Thank you. It was well done and it was really informative, like very educational. It just gave us a whole insight into behind the scenes of how tough it is. You know, it's hard work. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's funny actually what, when I watched it, cause it premiered um, at the Toronto film festival, which was fantastic. And actually, Funny, when the people started to make the movie, AP didn't know that he was going to retire or he was going to announce. It still wasn't, you know, he still didn't know. Mm -hmm. So it just all worked out very well that he decided in the middle of the of the film that he it was time for him, him to retire. But my, I remember watching it um, at the Toronto Film Festival when it was premiered. And, you know, you probably when I and, and obviously he was retired then, you know, and you think, gosh, I really would not go back to that life again. I mean, I am totally. I am yeah. totally retired as a jockey's wife. I mean, that's it. <laughs> like, yeah. but when you're in the middle of it, you know, it is just the norm. You know, all the falls, the, you know, the. I mean, he would probably ride in a thousand races a year, and he'd probably, you know, fall six or seven percent of the time. So, you know, there was a lot of hospital visits and that. But that was just all part of it. He's lucky to get out in one piece. You you must be very very strong, Chanel. Um, you know, uh, yes, I I am I am strong. Um. And I've learned to be, you know, and I, I say to people sometimes, you know, none of us are born resilient. You know, it's it, it's a muscle that you build up over time. You know, when you get knockbacks, you know, it makes you stronger. And I think, you know, some people get hung up on, you know, well, I'm not born strong or, you know, nobody is, you know, nobody's born resilient. But, you know, and actually, I remember, you know, because obviously I was really busy in, in my career back then and, you know, trying to grow the medical business in, in, in Chanel and Loch Ray and, I'd often get a phone call from the doctor at the race course if AP had had a fall. And, uh, you know, they, they, they might say, you know, Chanel, uh, AP's on his way into the, uh, he's, he's, in, he's in the ambulance on his way into hospital. He's just, you know, ha ha sustained a very bad fall. And the first thing I would say to the doctor is, okay, hold on. Is AP moving his legs and is he conscious? Because for me, it meant then he's not paralyzed and he's not brain damaged. And then it's like I had to, you know, monitor my my um, my worry level. So as soon as the doctor said, you know, he's moving his legs, Chanel, and he's conscious, then I'm like, OK, right, relax. Right. Everything else is fixable. OK, you know, he's nearly got two of everything, you know, so so we're OK. So that. Yeah. So that was kind of my always my first um, my, my, my first response back to the doctor. And actually funny. Sometimes you'd get the doctors ringing you and the doctors would be panicking. And I'd be like, no, hold on a minute. Can we just all calm down here? Can you just please? <laughs> and then the doctor's like, oh, yeah, okay. No, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything else is. Exactly. You, know. you were the one breaking it down. Exactly. Yeah, because I, you know, I mean, somebody did a statistic when AP retired and he broke his bones 700 times or something in, in his oh, career. No. So, you know, you get, you get used to, um, you know, you get used to trying to gauge the fall and take the panic and the seriousness out of it, you know, very quickly in, in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You must yeah. be very resilient. Um, um, oh, yeah. You know, look, I mean, we all go through, I think definitely, you know, we were we were a bit unlucky with little Archie when he was um, very young. He was six months old. He had to have heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, I, I would be in the house a bit more the organizer and, you know, getting everything done. And I'm a bit of a fixer, you know, but actually that 
during that period, I mean, I absolutely just fell to bits and mm. was, was not strong at all and was not resilient. And that's when AP was incredible and, you know, really stepped up to the plate in terms of like, you know, the, I'm sorting this out, you know, don't, don't worry. And I think because he was very, um, he was very comfortable with dealing with the doctors, looking at x-rays, looking at scans, yes. you know, being in that hospital environment, you know, that, I mean, he could nearly diagnose himself by, by, by the end, but, you know, when, when he had falls, really? you know, and so that whole thing of, you know, taking Archie down to have his operation and, you know, all that kind of stuff, his surgery, AP was amazing. So, no, I'm sharing, like, you know, sorry to cross over you, but would you mind just sharing a little bit about that, what, what Archie with um, the yeah. So no, it was just to kind of show like, no, I'm not like totally superwoman here. You know, we all have our breaking point and, uh, and times when, when we're just not strong and, you know, and that's OK because we're all vulnerable and, you know, we're, it, it's hard to be to be strong all the time. But um, when Archie was born, he's now six years old. He had a very high pitched whistle when he was breathing. And, uh, you know, I took him to the doctors a few times and they were like, no, he's just got asthma. And, you know, I was like, no, well, it's not it's not a wheeze. This is like a whistle. It's literally like a bird. I mean, I'd have him in the supermarket and people would be looking at me thinking like, you know, my God, your child, you know, such a weird sound. Anyway, after about like 10 visits to the GP and I was like a crazy woman at this stage and they, you know, just very dismissive. I just put him in the car and I drove him up to London I went into the Portland hospital and, you know, look, I know I'm very lucky that, that I, I, I was able to do that, you know, financially to, to, to go in. But, you know, and I just said, I, I just need to see respiratory. I mean, this child is sick and I am not leaving here until I get a consultant down here. I'll sit here all night. So um, so a respiratory consultant came down, um, looked at him and really within 48 hours, he was undergoing heart surgery. And, and what had oh, happened so quick so quick because you know it was it was quite dangerous what had happened but but what had happened was that his pulmonary artery had collapsed onto the entrance to his lungs so he couldn't he wasn't getting the air in and out of his lungs uh like he should have been and you know then he had like an infection then and you know he wasn't able to clear it because he wasn't the air wasn't able to go around so if if it had been left long term he it, it would have been fatal for him so what they did was they went in um and they picked up the pulmonary artery or one of that main artery that collapsed and they connected it really to the wall of his of his body um and they he they relieved it from his from the entrance into his lungs and um you know so now over time the entrance to his lungs has opened up, um, not as much as, as normally, but, you know, he he is like, I mean, now and again, when he's out of breath, you hear the little whistle um, going, but yeah. I mean, he's very healthy. Totally. Uh, but I mean, that was just, it was a little bit, uh, that, that you know, just a, it was just a tough, tough few, few weeks, um, you know, but we were lucky with the, the medical care that we got and, you know, and AP leading the charge while I was like a, a mess. Oh, sure. I, I know, I know, but he's your little baby. You know, it's like, it's yeah. so, just so different. You feel such oh, a God. different sense of responsibility yeah. towards your own child. Yeah. I do, yeah. For sure. Definitely. Naturally, naturally, that was very stressful. Are mm. you a spiritual person, Chanel? Um, I am. And uh, believe it or not, I, I, I actually say prayers every night with the kids in bed. We have our, our two or three little prayers and we have a chat with the grannies up in heaven and, you know, get them to look after us and thank Holy God for everything, you know, for health and happiness. And, yeah. um, you know, so I just, yeah, I, 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 I had that instilled in me as, as a child and I, I wanted the kids, you know, to know that, you know, holy God is there and, you know, that he's, you know, thank him for everything that we have and we have to be good people and health and happiness is way more important than money and never, never pray for money, never look for money, you know, that, that they, that's not an important value in life, you know, if that comes along and you have enough to survive and, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's great. But, you know, um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's in, that's just us, you know, we, we're not huge mass goers um we probably i probably take the kids to mass maybe once every three or four weeks you know because eve my daughter competes a lot at the show jumping so we're away now a, a lot but you know mm -hmm. the, the prayers are even actually last night um you know the kids like if i if they ever think i'm going to forget they'll be like mommy you know what about the prayers 
you know, so they're used to it now because it's so quick. It's only like it's only one or two little birds, you know, so it's not like they're dreading it. I know. You know? Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. very cute. Mm-hmm. And well, I'm sure you've been drawing off something because, you know, you've been through a lot. And I was watching you in being AP. I was actually looking at that movie through my fingers, actually, at, at some points because it was oh, so God. hard to watch. Um, mm. Like super tough. It was very impressed by it all. And I was looking at you and I was thinking, my gosh, you're, right. you're some woman. It's tough. You know, that would be um, your heart yeah. is in, in your mouth all the time. You know, I'd imagine. I wouldn't change one bit of it. I mean, it was the best life, the best fun. We had loads of highs and, you know, plenty of lows. But, you know, there was more highs than lows. And we celebrated every winner AP had. And, you know, we really had such a fantastic life you know, out of his career. And I mean, as I say to him, you know, I was just on the coattails, you know, there um, socially as well and our friends and, you know, and we still, you know, it's just great that AP is still involved in racing because some yeah. sports people, you know, they, they turn their back on the sport because they find it psychologically too difficult to stay, you know, there in in the sport. And, um, you know, it's like what they say, a sports person is the only person that dies twice, you know, they, they kind of die when they retire. And I mean, I know that's a little bit more, but, but it is, it's very difficult when, yeah. when they do retire. And I think it even is the same, the, the, the same feeling is for people in business. You know, you've been a successful business person for years and suddenly you're, you're retired and, you know, you're looking at your cereal in the morning thinking, what's my purpose now? You know, but sure. But all the experience he's gained. Yeah the years and mm. I mean he, he must be like a horse whisperer at this stage you know he would have so much knowledge I'd mm. imagine so many people you know young jockeys coming up um, yeah. you know the ranks would be you know he, they would love five minutes with him you know to get his insight and tips mm. and advice yeah and he you know he, he is great with with the younger people um, with the younger jockeys and some of them come over to the house to watch replays and to go through the re- you know for him to go through the replays but I mean generally he's he's a good mentor anyway because I I definitely think he helped me a lot over the years because you know it's like when you know you live with somebody or you know you're 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 working on a team and you know you start to emulate the behavior of your workmates or your leader you know mm-hmm. definitely his kind of determination and his will to win certainly rubbed off on me because I mean, there'd be a lot of times I'd come back in the evening or come back from a business trip and I'd say to him, you know, I can't get this deal over the line or I can't crack the customer or can't get into the market. And, you know, he'd always be like, you know, Chanel, you know, never accept you are defeated. You know, never accept no. He said, mm-hmm. you know, it's like he would literally say, you know, man up and get back out there. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So he, he, he really, well, he helped me drive myself a lot. Um, and he, he, you know, now he, he, he does speaking and he does, you know, kind of that kind of stuff, motivational speaking, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for, you know, he knows about being number one and staying number one. And that's that's hard is, is to stay number one consistently for 20 years in your sport. Yeah. And so impressive. I mean, you're a great support to one another and you're a super team. You're, you know, it's all about the teamwork at home. Not long mate last. We're surviving lockdown anyway, so that's good. <laughs> so right, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little with a uh, bit with me about your morning ritual, what's what's it like for you when the first moment you open your eyes in the morning? How does your day begin? Right. So I am literally like clockwork with this. Okay. Um, I wake at six, and I don't mean to go back to the CBD again, but actually, the one thing I notice, I take I take the CBD, my CBD in the morning. Okay. But the one thing I notice since I've been taking it that when I wake up, I have so much more energy, you know, when you wake up in the morning, normally I'd be like stuck to the bed going, okay, give me another five minutes, give me another 10 minutes. But no, I'm awake, I'm ready. I, I, my body feels like it's had, it's had enough sleep. I try and get seven hours sleep a night. So I wake at seven. Um, I don't close my curtains at night, actually. So um, I wake and uh, down, teeth washed downstairs in my pajamas, coffee, slice of brown toast straight into the office, you know, with the coffee and the toast. Everybody else obviously is asleep. And I get so much done in the office from that kind of quarter past six until about half eight. 
in the morning. Um, and then, you know, upstairs, I, I go in, I do a Zoom class, try and do it every morning, a gym Zoom class, a quarter to nine to quarter past nine, so the 15 minutes or a half an hour. I do definitely four days a week, just mentally, um, I feel I, I'm more productive for that half hour. And then, you know, quick hour back in the office and, we we stop. AP comes into the house for one o'clock if he's been out. I stop at one. We religiously have lunch at one o'clock with the kids. Um, you know, at this stage, my lovely niece Shanine McCoy has taken the kids, got them up, and got them in homeschooling started. We have lunch at one o'clock, which I think is really important. You know, to have that that time, even you know, half an hour, and then you know, back in the office till about probably six. And um, you know, and tea time is pretty relaxed. You know, sometimes I eat with the kids. You know, AP comes in. He doesn't come in till about nine, eight or nine now because he's out out in, around the yard all the time. You know, so so that but that's great because I'm not traveling or um, you know. So so I, I I think it's so important. I don't know for me. I get I'm so much more productive in the morning because once the yeah. phone starts and all the emails start coming in. You know, you get so you get so tr- sidetracked. So I always do my number one priority. Whatever is the most important thing to be done that day gets done between half six in the morning and half eight. You know, so you you kind of deal with the tough kind of uh, yeah. parts of the day at the beginning of the day, get them out of the way, and then yeah. right, yeah, definitely yeah, because. Good. I'm I'm my freshest and I have Kay Burley on in the background. I watch Sky News in the background all day, every day. Yeah, I love too. Um, me too. Know, so that keeps me, it keeps me. So what that. have you learned about yourself during the pandemic, Chanel? Uh, it's good. It's a good. It's a good question. Um, think anything new about yourself? Um, I definitely. Um, I, I I'll definitely have. I'll, be putting changes in place like I'm never going to go back to the pace probably that I was at in terms of you know AP and I would definitely have been gone three or four nights a week out you know that was just either his commitments at night or my commitments you know we do stuff separately we do stuff together you know so we both kind of said that we really need to limit that because actually the time that we have at home in the evenings with the kids or even just to to recharge you know that we're not we're not so exhausted uh, anymore yeah. so you know I think that's probably one thing I've learned about myself is that you know it's been very manic and and the, I would be exhausted and I feel so that that's yeah you know and I, I just and I I think I've learned how important it is for the kids that you're around I mean my kids adore lockdown they never wanted to end because mommy and daddy yeah every night mm-hmm. and we get we get to you know have have lunch every day with mommy and daddy and mommy is always in the house because she's just there in the office if we need her because the mm-hmm. office is in the kitchen so i i have learned that you know this is really important for the kids and this is something that they really love and they they thrive they you know i've seen real confidence progression with with, with our son archie who's six you know he's just really come out of himself and that probably is Mommy, daddy around, you know, he's getting more attention. His confidence is growing. You know, that's that that's definitely another thing. And, you know, I think we're all going to be a little bit more selective of who we spend time with and who are the important people For in sure. our lives because they're the people that you've really missed. I've, you know, I'm, there's five kids in the family and luckily we're all very close, you know, and, and I love their company and I miss their company. Um, you know, I'm starting to see my sister, one of my sisters a little bit now, which is which is nice. Um, you know, and spending time with, with my mom and actually going for a long period of time without seeing my mom, um, you know, it's really made me feel like I need to spend more time with good quality time with her and go back to Ireland a bit more to see her. So yeah. that's, yeah, so a few, few good things, you yeah. know. And um, actually, we're saving a lot of money, not shopping, you know. Well, only- this is the other thing. Well, for sure. Yeah. And um, like pre-COVID, obviously, and post-COVID, did you enjoy entertaining? Yeah, we, and, you know, I like when AP was growing up, you know, there were six kids in his house and it was a totally open house. It was like a bus station. His mom, you know, she's sadly passed away now, but she was just the most social woman you know, she would have people literally calling all day, cups of teas, chat. And, you know, my house growing up as well was very busy. My mom was very warm. Um, 
you know, so we always had visitors and I love that. I, I, I prefer when people just arrive that they don't ring me and say, can I come at that time? Because then I'm like, you know, I, I like people just dropping in. Um, and we do, you know, we hold kind of Christmas here every year for maybe 16 of our friends. Um, and, and we, we have it here every, every year in our house and we would, you know, I love having people around. I love dinners. I love just, you know, so we, we, I miss that, you know, so um, I think we can have six people around now with the lockdown. But yeah, that's true. That's a good thing. And do you like hosting? I do. I do. I love it. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a good cook. I can't mm-hmm. actually cook really at all. Um, but, um, and, and all my good girlfriends know that. So then when we come around, they either bring, they share dishes, you know, or we, we get some help. In. Maybe Perfect. Some- I get a takeaway. But yeah. you like the whole kind of organizing it and um, probably yeah. that part of it, the hosting part is fun. Yeah. And yeah. hey, that's a job in itself. You can't you can't be in the kitchen and be a good host at the same time. That's what I always no. say. I know, but just, you know, just catching up with people. And- exactly. And how important is social media to you in your business? Um, so this business now um, that's launched the, the purest uh, CBD, um, this is the first business that I've done where we're B to C, you know, where we've gone business direct to the consumer. Um, the other, you know, with in, when when I had time, when I worked in Chanel Pharma in in Loch Ray, that was always B to B, you know. So we were never selling to actually the end user. We were selling to our customer who then sell, sold on to the end user. So I've learned a lot about the importance of. Um, of social media um, and, uh, you know, how, yeah, I mean, how absolutely critical it is, but to have a good social media strategy um, and to, you know, follow the appropriate guidelines and, um, you know, to conduct your business very professionally um, through through social media. But, you know, I also learned as well, um, and I, I, I do some kind of online courses um, that, you know, it's the, the power of word of mouth, that word of mouth now generates two times more sales than traditional advertising wow. because we trust our friends and our colleagues. You know, so now I'm, I'm doing a, a course at the moment about how you turn your customers into advocates, you know. So it's really, you know, and that's where I feel, you know, that I know my product works because we've had really good feedback from people who are taking it. Um, and it's, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of other people uh, who want the product based on word of mouth um, from from people who were taking it. So it, it and I, I you know, and, and that's the statistic I found that word of mouth generates two times more sales than, than traditional advertising. So that is really important as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you know, it, you like that old saying, you're only as good as your last job or. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's how it goes, but it's so true. Yeah, and I think especially, you know, with a product like this, that it's a it's a food supplement, you know, it's something that you pay money, you know, um, and, and you want it to work, you know, so it 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 has to work, you know, and, and it from the trials we've done and everything, it, it, it does work, you know, that we we've had that feedback. I mean, I'm sure there's gonna be one or two people popping up, you know that that don't get a response but you know they may not realize it but cbd is very good for your immune system you know so while they may not feel it physically or emotionally because they may be already quite balanced emotionally and they may have no physical ailments Mm -hmm. uh, you know but it will still be working internally in in the immune system um yeah so so it has like a healing property yeah yes yes it, it it has you know that's that is kind of you know there there are something like 23 different ailments that cbd can be used for and and this is not just my opinion these are you know papers clinical papers that have been written or scientific papers that have been written by you know academics where they have looked at the mode of action of cbd how it responds within the body um and and the different areas that it it heals yeah it's got huge, huge healing properties if you have the right CBD with nothing else in it, if it's pure CBD. My gosh, it, it just sounds really phenomenal. Hopefully, yeah, it is. Hopefully. Yeah. So you have a very exciting year ahead of you. Um, well, yeah. You, you, uh, and um, where do you see yourself in the next five years, Janelle? 
Um, I mean, I'm I'm four and a half years on on the CBD journey, um, mm-hmm. getting getting to you know to where where we are now with with product um, on the market. Um, you know, and I I would hope, and I mean, what age am I now? I'm actually forty four. Um, so in five years' time, I would hope that we have a huge community of our CBD users who have um, reversed, you know, ailments and have a really better quality of life, um, better health. And, um, you know, and we have clawed back all the money we've put into clinical trials and we have been able to, you know, have a good financially stable company um, and, you know, continuing to grow and continuing to do lots of research and development with the money that, that we generate to continue to bring out um, new drugs and even, well, not drugs, but new food supplements and even combinations, you know, mixing it with other uh, good, you know, chamomile, vitamin D, you know, do combination products. So Mm -hmm. I I see myself in the CBD space for many years to come. I I have no sign of retiring for a long time. Yeah, it sounds exciting. And what advice would you give to your younger self, Chanel, looking back over your career? Uh, You know, I I think, you know, I actually spoke to students recently, you know, and I spoke to them about um, about being resilient because, you know, that there is um, there is there is a lot of anxiety and um, worry among uh, young people, uh, be it social pressure um you know be it exams um for lots of different reasons and you know that it is um it it is trying to find that that level of resilience and to be a bit stronger um and not you know to 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 realize that it's okay to get knockbacks um it's it's important now and again to get knockbacks but it's it's being able to bounce back from them and dust yourself down and say, you know what, I'm going to take the learning out of that. And that, ex- that knockback is going to make me stronger because I'm going to be wiser and better going in or I'm going to be, you know. Um, so I would say that to young people. I would say to them, you know, to have empathy in everything in terms of your career, with your friends, with your family. You know, and for me, empathy is about putting yourself in other people's shoes you know, and and not judging people or not, you know, if somebody is unpleasant to you or is negative to you, not to be so quick to judge, you know, it's like, well, you just don't know what's going on in their lives. You That's know, so, but, true. so empathy now, now in this era, uh, in the last probably three to five years and even more so going forward, you know, will get you far in life, in business and, and dealing with people. Um, and and it's, so they're kind of the two things, resilience and empathy, um, is to be aware of them and to try and work on them when, when you're young and, and try and find a mentor. It doesn't have to be somebody physically, you know, it's somebody online. There are, I mean, a wealth of information out there about, mm-hmm. you know, whether, it doesn't matter what you're into, you know, if you're into skateboarding or chess or business or, you know, go and find the best people in the industry in what you're interested in. And listen to them, listen to their talks, listen to their advice, you know, and, and take it on board because they are successful. They have reached the heights, you know, and I just think, you know, copy the best people. And then when you get as, when you get as good as them, then just be better than them. <laughs> so Yeah, for sure. What's, the, the, what's the best piece of advice you've ever personally received? Um, I mean, I remember somebody told me before, and I know I, I talked about, you know, values before dollars and that money wasn't a massive motivator for me, but it always kind of stuck in me, you know, the, that the best way to make money is to solve people's problems. Mm-hmm. So you know, when people come up to me with a business idea, um, which I suppose on the back of Dragon's Den, um, I, you know, I'd often, people would often talk about different business ideas, you know, and I, I would kind of say to them, is this really solving a problem? Is there really a need for this? You know, um, how are you going to generate? I mean, especially people that come up with all these amazing ideas with an app. I'd say, no, that is amazing. But how are you going to generate revenue? Are you going to charge for the app? Are you going to no? Well, I'm not going to charge for that because nobody else does. I'm like, well, you know, mm-hmm. so that was that was kind of um, 
that 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 was one thing is you know the best way to to make money is to solve people's problems and also mm-hmm. you know i i read um mark benioff he is the founder of salesforce which is a hugely successful company you know and and he would have been very money orientated and probably ego and it was all about making millions and being number one and and he had kind of a life changing experience um during his career and realized that actually you know that's all just materialistic stuff and and he talks about values before dollars and that's when i heard that that really resonated with me so mm-hmm. that was a really good piece of advice you know to anybody in business or kind of going into businesses you know look you gotta you gotta get the values right and you gotta know your why why are you in business we all know what we do and we know you know how to do it but um you know there's some kind of fundamental things that will really help uh make the business successful absolutely and uh fast forward say to the end of this year christmas 2020 how will you be spending christmas this year do you think um, the same way as we have spent the last kind of 20 years and hopefully, you know, it'll it'll be the same. But we have kind of 16, 18 friends. They're our best friends um, and they they come around for um, for dinner, every, you know, every Christmas. Um, all the girls share the cooking and it's just a really, really happy day. You know, mm-hmm. that sounds yeah. great. Mm-hmm. And we'll be in a much happier space by then hopefully also so it's all good and yeah. if, if your home was on fire Chanel and your family was outside and you could only save three objects what would they be it would definitely be my laptop my phone and uh and, and probably uh my wallet or something <laughs> your passport Oh yeah, maybe my passport. No, yeah, yeah, I actually could, could yeah, maybe my passport. Definitely my laptop and my phone. I mean, that's and what's everything. the one one piece in your home that holds the most special memories for you outside of those three things? Oh, do you know what? There is actually no, this is well, AP would have grabbed these. AP would have grabbed the Grand National Trophy when he won the Grand National in 2010. <laughs> and he would have grabbed the um BBC, the BBC Sports Personality of the Year trophy, mm-hmm. which he won. And he probably would have grabbed his knighthood um, from yeah. Medal Queen as well. So they're probably his three things. Yeah. So they they would be, um, you know, they're hugely. Uh, I mean, they were just the best days, kind of, of our lives, and just the best accolade for him in terms of a real mark of, you know, you've done well in your career. You know, what well sure. done. Kind of and what was that moment like when, when he got his knighthood, when he received his knighthood? What was that like for you? Were you very proud? I'd imagine you were. Very proud. I think, do you know, I think before that we had had the Grand National, which was just really, he really, really wanted to win that desperately more than anything. You know, and that was followed by the, the BBC Sports Award. And he never in a million years, I remember going there that night and, you know, he was kind of thinking, oh, we leave early now. And, you know, he didn't in his wildest dreams think he'd win, you know, because he was a jockey and, you know, he just didn't think that it would have the support, you know. And then, uh, you know, when the knighthood came, that was just, I mean, it, he was just like, I could literally die now. I mean, I just, I'm so, yeah. and like he's very humble, you know, but it's it was like, you know, you, you nearly have to convince him to be proud of himself and be proud, you know, what he's done for the sport. Yeah, that just it's it's a huge acknowledgement for all of his hard work. Acknowledgement, yeah, that's that's the word, Arlene. The acknowledgement. Yeah. And I'm just gonna ask you something very separately now. It's called the yeah. quick fire round of questions. Are you ready? Uh yep. Yeah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Bath or shower? Shower. Text or talk? Talk. Morning or night person? Morning. Taxi or walk? Taxi. (laughs) (laughs) Home or abroad? Home. Cheltenham or Ascot? Oh, Cheltenham. Horse riding or Gaelic football? Horse riding. Interiors or fashion? Fashion. (laughs) Eat in or eat out? Eat in. News or Netflix? News. And the last one is 2020 or 2021? Uh, 2020. 2020. Yeah. Well, it's been pretty good for you so far. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, Chanel, thank you so much for chatting with me today. And I really hope to meet you again in the not so distant future. Yeah, great. No, thank you so much um, for having me on. I really enjoy your podcast anyway. I think you're you're fantastic. So it was a very easy yes to, to come today and uh, speak to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chanel. Take care. Um, bye-bye.